Hello, my name is Claire Michkowski, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you about today's program. Please let us know your feedback by contacting us on social media or via email at doleinstitute at ku.edu. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We would like to encourage each of you to consider to consider becoming friends with the Dole Institute. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you are interested. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Hansen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for braving the elements and joining us today. Uh, it's not quite winter yet, but it feels like it. But just wait, Sunday, I guess it's supposed to be 75 and sunny, so. Anyway, again, thank you for joining us. I want to thank the Dole Institute for, again, extending or continuing to extend an invitation to us to make these presentations. That fact and your presence indicates that we're doing something right. And I think that uh, after today's presentation, you'll agree that we continue to have a commitment to excellence. Now, today's presentation talks about U.S. containment policy of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now, back at Leavenworth, those three phrases, Cold War, containment policy, and Soviet Union, all require about 20 minutes of contextual explanation <laughs> for the students, most of whom were born in the administration of George Bush 41. But without making any accusations, and based on my own highly unscientific visual survey of the class, <laughs> I think we can omit that today, okay? All right, as I said, it's going to, we're going to talk about uh, Cold War policy. Today's presenter is uh, no stranger to the Cold War. He is a former Army officer, a uh, retired air defense officer, uh, whose service included time down uh, or in, uh, in the Middle East for the Persian Gulf War. After he left the military, Dr. Mills went uh, to the corporate world for several years before deciding that his first love was history, and he returned to school and completed a PhD at the University of North Dakota. For the next several years, he taught undergraduate history before accepting a Fulbright teaching fellowship to go to Russia and teach English his or American history for six months, despite the fact that he speaks not one word of Russian, even today. I do speak one word. Yet. Yet, okay. <laughs> okay, you get credit for that one. Uh, he's, he's been a member of our faculty since August of 2016. He's the author of the book, Cold War in a Cold Land, Fighting Communism on the, Great, on the Northern Plains. Oh, yeah. Now that is not a screenplay for yet another remake of Red Dawn. It's actually a very interesting book. It talks about the intersection of ideology, domestic politics, and military policy in the uh, Dakotas and Montana in the 1950s and 60s. And his next book, which is due in February, February. Uh, talks about the uh, response to and aftermath of the great blizzard of 48. 48 or 49? 49. 49, I'm sorry. Um, it's actually an interesting discussion of an early federal response to a natural disaster under conditions that most people wouldn't think qualify as a natural disaster, right? It's just snow, right? But. It, it's a fascinating look at uh, some of the, the successes and failures of that early effort. Uh, and I, I particularly recommend it if you like pictures of snow removal equipment. The color plates are fascinating. So please, join me in giving a warm welcome to our Cold War presenter, Dr. David Mills. Thanks, Dr. Hansen. And again, thank you everyone for coming out this afternoon. Uh, taking part in the, in the Dole uh, Center's presentations on, uh, that incorporate CGSC history. Uh, I thought I'd start out with a, with a story. As Dr. Hansen just pointed out, I, I spent six months in Russia uh, teaching American history there. 
And uh, so I, I got to give a number of presentations, and, and he's right, I, I speak one word of Russian. Maybe, maybe when I was there I spoke a little bit more than that, but not a whole lot. Uh, I, I depended on the, the, uh, tra the, the good graces of my colleagues there to translate, many of whom had been to America and spoke English and, uh, and, and, uh, and helped me out that way. Well, I, I got to give a number of presentations, uh, not only to the faculty, to the students, but often they would open it up, these presentations, to the, the entire community. I taught in a, in a, a city uh, named Ufa, Russia, a uh, city of a million people that you've probably never heard of. But uh, so one of these, one day I got to give this presentation on, on the American educational system, and I couldn't help but notice uh, this guy. Uh, who, who came in and uh, sat in the back of the classroom. Now, there's probably two things that you'll notice from this picture. One is, one of these guys really needs a haircut. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to go into a barber and say a little off the sides and just trim the top, so I just let it grow. Um, but the other, uh, a, Soviet, a former Soviet naval officer came to my, to my, co to my uh, presentation. And so afterwards, he comes up and, and uh, he introduces himself, and, uh, and he's smiling. He seems very engaged, very happy to, to meet me, and he, he goes to shake my hand. And fortunately, I'd gotten my grip just right, because he, he is squeezing for all he's worth. He's trying, he's trying to put me down on the ground, and for it, I'm squeezing right back. And then, and then he lets go, and he does, does the big Russian jovial laugh, and, and then he goes, gives me a hug, and he, as, we're, as he hugs me, we start going around in circles. Like, like he's, he's like, we can continue to hug or we can fight. It's your call. And he'd have been fine with either one. Uh, so I'm not really sure how to, how to deal with uh, everything that's going on, so I start wrestling back. And, uh, but b before we start rolling on the floor, uh, somebody, you know, somebody else comes in and, and, in, and starts hugging and, and saying, okay, shake and go to your separate corners type thing. Um, and, and so so that, that, uh, that incident really struck me, really kind of stayed with me. And so I was thinking about it for quite a while afterwards. And I, and I was thinking, you know, was he really being that aggressive? Or was that just something that I was projecting? Or was, or was, was that something that I was... Uh, thinking about something that I had invented or, or assumed to be happening. And then I thought, you know, maybe that's kind of a microcosm of the Cold War. You know, these two, well, not old guys with gray hair necessarily, but, you know, two countries making a whole lot of assumptions about what's happening, interpreting each other's moves uh, um, as aggressive when maybe they weren't. And then I thought, nah, I didn't imagine that. I'd, I know what I know what happened. So, uh, so you're you're probably all aware that we at, at CGSC don't just teach history classes. We often uh, try and have a point anyway. And and one of the recurring themes that that takes place throughout the the course of the military history programs or the courses that we teach. Uh, is this theme of, of history theory doctrine, right? It, it, it carries out uh, from start to finish, which is, okay, there's an event that happens, people think about it, and then your doctrine comes from that. I'm sure that you've all heard the saying, well, they prepared to fight the next war by looking at the last one, right? And, and, and so that's, that's really what we do, and it, and it works if you get the history piece right. And let me show you what I mean. So if you, if you think about history, history is a particular knowledge or, or what happens. And then from that, you, you look at the history, you think about it, you interpret it, you ask yourself some questions, and then you figure out what does this mean, and, and, and military history particularly. And then once you figure out what it means, then you can start looking at your doctrine and how you're going to fight the next war based on what you learned from the last war and, and what you can assume going forward. And so another way to think of this is what dead guys did, what dead guys thought about it, 
and how to avoid becoming dead guys. Right? So it kind of makes sense if, if you think about it. And so this is the, this is the recurring theme that, that we keep coming back to in CGSC. And it, I, I think you, you all probably know that each one, one of the classes that we've been teaching for, here at the Dole Center for the last few months has been a variation or, uh, on one of the classes that we teach to our students. So the question that we often ask them is, what happens if you get this history piece wrong? The, the war that you prepare for versus the war that you get are often very, very different based on the assumptions that you make, the, 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 the history that you learn, the, the, history, the lessons from history that you interpret, right? I mean, the French coming out of World War I think that the, believe that the best defense is a good defense. And so that leads to the Maginot Line, which doesn't really work out too well. Uh, in the summer of 1940. Uh, same thing in World War I. The assumptions that some of those nations had made about what the next war is going to look like were, were simply wrong, which led to uh, four years of stalemate and, and trench warfare. So as our students are up and coming senior leaders in the Army, these are some of the lessons that we're trying to, to pass on. Now you've all probably also heard the phrase, uh, those who don't study their history are bound to repeat it, right? Well, we, we, we think about history in a little bit different way in CGSC. And, and, and one, of, one of those uh, tenets that we kind of abide by is that history proves nothing. It, but, it, but it can su suggest a great deal. Um, we also like to, to tell our students, history doesn't give you any answers either but it can tell you what questions that you should be asking. And so the kind of the way that we've broken down this CGSC curriculum is we spend uh, 11 weeks talking about mo uh, military warfare from about 1600 up through World War I. And then the next piece is uh, we look at the interwar period. So what were, the, what were the lessons learned from World War I? And then you look at the interwar period, what are, what are the different nations thinking? How are they planning? Uh, what are the innovations that they're making? What does their doctrine look like? And then we spend the, the, the other half of the, this class talking about were they right or were they wrong? And then the, the next block, which is, uh, is the roots of operational strategy, uh, the, the class that, or the uh, presentation that we're gonna have today is really the foundational class for that. Uh, which is the roots of, of uh, or, uh, nuclear war and containment. So underpinning this last block of instruction is containment and nuclear weapons, nuclear warfare. What, what does that mean in the overall context of the Korean War, the Vietnam War, post-Vietnam, up even through Desert Shield, Desert Storm? And uh, any conversation that you have about the Cold War era has to begin with uh, the idea of containment and the idea uh, that nuclear weapons and the possibility of nuclear warfare are ever present. And how does that shape the world that we then live in? And so the class that begins with uh, nuclear weapons and containment, uh, as you can imagine, kind of picks up right after at the end of World War II and suggest that with the, with the dropping of the bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945, the world fundamentally changes, not just militarily, but for society as well. I mean, I, I, as, a, uh, as a historian, I, I can get lost looking at, at newspapers from the 1940s, 1950s. I, I probably spend twice as much time researching as I probably should because I just start looking at all of the old uh, newspapers and start reading articles that have absolutely nothing to do with whatever it is that I'm supposed to be researching. But as a Cold War guy, one of the things that really interests me is, is the way that folks were looking at nuclear uh, energy in the late 1940s, 1950s, and it's really kind of a bipolar, uh, bifurcated approach to nuclear energy. One of which is kind of the upper right-hand corner is that nuclear energy can be very, very bad. I mean, maybe you recognize uh, Bert the Turtle, who was the, um, 
kind of the cartoon character or poster for uh, civil defense in the 1950s. And so nuclear energy can be really bad when it's directed at you in the form of a bomb, but otherwise it can be very, very cool. I mean, they were, I was reading articles about um, nuclear powered households, nuclear powered kitchens, nuclear powered airplanes, which, oh, by the way, I also read would have to be so heavily shielded by lead that they could never actually get off the ground either. But this is the way that folks are thinking about nuclear power in the 1950s, very much a, a two-pronged two approach. But right after 1945, how are people, particularly military theorists, how are they looking at, at warfare? How are future wars going to be fought, especially given the fact that at the, at the end of World War II, there's these two atomic bombs that are dropped? Well, theorists, military planners, uh, really, kind, really pretty divided on, on how this might look. Whole, a, a lot of folks say, the war is over. War as we know it is over because it will always uh, turn nuclear. That's the only way you can fight a war from now on, and, and we'll just never do that. Other folks um, had kind of different ideas about how it could be fought. Some, uh, perhaps a, a, a limited war, um, much smaller wars going forward, but that a lot of a lot of military planners really uh, were terrified by the idea of a limited war because it can quickly get out of control. And so, how is that going to look? Um, one thing that most folks agreed on, in 1945 to 1950-ish, is that you can never have another war like World War II again. The nuclear weapons kind of take that off the table. You can never have massed armies. Uh, they would make a great target for nuclear weapons. Um, massive um, fleets, armadas um, uh, of ships or planes really make that impossible going forward. Um, in fact, there are folks who are arguing that there is no longer a need for an army. You don't need a massive army because they will make a great nuclear target and they will be blown up and, and, and bombed out of existence. Therefore, you don't need them anymore. Hey, guess who was a big proponent of you don't need the army anymore? The Air Force, right? I mean, th so, so those, those folks are like, hey, we've, we've got you covered. Don't worry. Um, we can figure this out. You know who really hated this whole idea? It was the army, right? So, um, in fact... There, there is such a competition for budget and resources at this time that the Army tries, is, tries to eliminate the Marine Corps. Uh, a very concerted effort between 1945 and 1952 to, el to eliminate the redundancy. Uh, their argument was, you don't need two land armies anymore. You just need one. Um, and so there was a, quite a push by the Marine Corps, as you can imagine, to say, oh, yes, you, you still need us. We're relevant. Uh, anyway, <laughs> says the Marine. Uh, so, so Korea does prove the viability of limited wars, which is, which is another class. So I, I, I just wanted to mention that. I recognize that that, that becomes a thing. But underpinning, here, here's kind of the crux of, of the, the, the lesson here or the presentation is that uh, you've always got containment uh, issues. You've always got... Um, nuclear weapons issues uh, or nuclear weapons possibilities to, to contend with throughout this time. Now here's finally, right, kind of the agenda. Finally, he's going to tell us what, he, what we came here to, to talk about, which is uh, essentially the Truman administration, the Eisenhower administration, and then the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. How does nuclear weapons and containment fundamentally change in those, in those eras. Harry Truman essentially, um, once, once World War II is over, there is a, an immense amount of pressure to, to deactivate or, or, or send the, the boys home, send the troops home. Uh, on a previous slide, I just showed you at, at the height of World War II, we had 8 million soldiers in the Army at one time and 89 divisions. Uh, by 1950, we're down to just under 600,000 soldiers and uh, 20, or 
Ten, ten divisions, thank you. So we, we have just decimated the, the military, as we know, Turn, turning tanks into razor blades and, and automobiles and, and that sort of thing. The economy is doing great, and, and so folks are, are excited about the end of the war. They, this generation, they're the folks who suffered through the Great Depression. Uh, they sacrificed, uh, lived through that, only to, only to turn around and have to uh, sacrifice again uh, throughout World War II. The generation is ready for the sacrificing to be over, and they're ready for their families to be home. So there's a lot of pressure from society to deactivate the armies and, and, bring, and, and lower the, the uh, cost of the militaries. But at the same time, there's also this recognition that America is, is the lone superpower in the world. We, we have the atomic bomb. And so, um, so we, we can afford to um, deactivate or, or lower the, the number of folks in our military. Um, now, what are, now, what are folks thinking about, the, those theorists again? What are they thinking? So uh, Bernard Brody is a, is a theorist writing uh, about nuclear weapons and warfare right after World War II. You see, uh, he writes this book uh, in, in 1946. And he says, thus far, the chief purpose of our military establishment has been to win wars. From now on, our purpose must be to avert them. So he's one of those folks that thinks that we've, we've, we've uh, outgrown warfare. We, we won't, uh, because of the nuclear uh, aspect, we can never do, uh, go to war again. But it's a little more complicated than that, right? I mean, real, real life sets in. And you've got, to, you've got to start thinking about that, particularly when you have a nation like the Soviet Union, who's, who was our World, or a World War II ally. But if this was a marriage of convenience, it was a shotgun marriage at best. Uh, and, and there was tremendous tension between the United States, England, and the Soviet Union throughout that marriage. Now, as soon as the war is over, the Soviet Union begins acting somewhat erratically as far as the American government is concerned. They, they appear to be breaking their word on agreements that, that were reached with President Roosevelt. Roosevelt always felt that relations with the Soviet Union would be great uh, after the war. Turns out to not really be the case. And in fact, uh, in 1946, something happens that that really bugs the White House. First, the, uh, the Russians, the Americans, and the, and the Brits have occupied Iran to keep the Germans from gaining a foothold and, and the, the resources there, namely petroleum. And then after the war is over, everybody agrees to, to withdraw, except the Soviets don't. They've become hard to deal with. So eventually they do withdraw under threat of the, uh, the Navy and, and military intervention. So finally they do withdraw, but, but folks are, you know, the administra Truman administration is asking themselves, what has fundamentally changed? And when Stalin gives a speech in early 1946 in which he essentially declares the Cold War, he says that the United States and Great Britain will eventually go to war over stuff, as all capitalist nations must eventually do, the Soviet Union would then be able to step in and, and save the day, so to speak. And so, so the White House is really confused about what is the message that, that is being sent. And so they ask a guy named uh, George F. Kennan, who has spent the war in the Soviet Union as a member of the State Department there, what are they talking about? What is going on? We need clarity. What's going on with the Soviet Union? And so he, he historically uh, or infamously sends this long telegram, the length of which has been debated. Uh, some, some folks say you know, 5,000 words. Some people say 8,000 words. Whatever it was, it was a whole lot of uh, tying up the, the telegraph system between the United States and Soviet Union. Essentially what he says is the Soviets are unreasonable people. You're not imagining things. You really are having problems dealing with the Soviets because they're not reasonable. Now, why aren't they reasonable? Because for centuries, they've been invaded and, and uh, have been a, in, uh, in, in, at war with, with folks for one reason or another. And so they're very paranoid 
for one thing. But the, the, the other reason is, for centuries, you've had leadership like the czars um, and then the, the, so, the, uh, the communists or the Soviets who have assumed power and in order to stay in power have to do things like uh, crack down brutally on their own people. Now, the only reason that they can get away with that is because they're telling their people that we're doing it for your own good because there's a bad guy out there, a worse guy, who is, in, our, in that case, the Americans. The United States of America is awful. They, are, they want to invade your country. They want to take away your government and your freedoms. And so we must have this dictatorial government for your own protection. In other words, the United States has to always serve as the bad guy for a bunch of thugs who, who wish to remain in power in the Soviet Union. This was exactly the kind of message that folks in the State Department and the administration are looking to hear at this time. This is exactly the message that they want. At the end, Kennan says, uh, containment. The adroit and vigilant application of counterforce is the best prescription for dealing with the Soviet Union. And so th this telegram is very popular when he comes back, or, or it is very popular when it's sent. It's, it's met, no, numerous copies are made and, and, and sent all over the government, and, and people are looking at this and, and, and agreeing with it. And so po such a popular message that Secretary of the Navy Forrestal asks him to write an, an entire article. Uh, expand on what you meant in the telegram and write an entire article. Uh, and, and he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about writing an article because by this time he's back in Washington, D.C. He's a high-ranking member of the State Department. He says, you know, I don't want this to be perceived as official American policy about what we're, what we're doing. And so, and, uh, so uh, Forrestal says, no problem. Nobody ever reads academic journals anyway. Uh, and just sign it X, and, and so he does. And, and so people start comparing the telegram with the article and pretty, pretty quickly figure out that it was, it was Kennan that wrote it, and it becomes very popular. The Reader's Digest even publishes a, a, an excerpted uh, version of the article. And it's, it's extremely popular, and essentially what he says is you have to contain the Soviet Union. Now what he meant was, there are diplomatic ways, there are economic ways, there are political ways, there are social ways, and oh, by the way, there are military ways. But what everybody gets out of this article is you must confront the Soviets militarily, because everything else is too slow, doesn't, doesn't really work that well. And Kennan had said, look, this is going to be a long process. This is not going to be quick. You have to contain them, but eventually the Soviet Union will collapse under, the, under its own weight the inconsistencies within this, the communist government will eventually just collapse the entire system. You just have to be patient. Well, nobody wants to wait around for 70 years, right, for, for this thing to, to eventually fall apart. So um, what they do is adopt this ideology or, or, or foreign policy of containment, which, which becomes our foreign policy for the next 40, 50, 60 years, it, it, it can be argued. Korea, Vietnam, uh, de certainly a reflection of this idea that you must contain the spread of communism. Now, in 1949, it appears that communism is on the march around the world. After we've just decided that our approach is going to be containment, China falls to communism. There's the, the Berlin airlift. Uh, and in August 1949, the Soviets get their, the, explode their first atomic bomb. Uh-oh. It appears that we've got a major problem on our hands, right? We, we, we said that we have to stop communism from spreading around the world. And, and, and in the two years since we decided that, you know, China has fallen and, and, um, and now the Soviets have nuclear weapons themselves. And so there's a, a study that's, that's done. It's, it's called NSC 68, National Security Council Report 68, in which the, the, the federal government does a review on where are we, what are we looking at. And, and long story short, what they decide is we are absolutely unprepared 
to deal with communism on the march around the world. We've, you, we, we've adopted this policy of containment, and yet we're not prepared uh, at all to confront communism. And so the, the article argues, or the, the report argues, we have to have a massive buildup of conventional forces um, in order to confront the Soviets, particularly in Europe, where, which, which we see as, as pretty key. Um, so defense spending increases from $13 billion a year up to upwards of $50 billion uh, pretty quickly, even through the Korean War and into the first uh, admit, uh, years of the Eisenhower administration. It's, it's incredibly large m amount of money that's being spent. So as, as we all know, June 25th, 1950, North Korea invades into South Korea. Uh, and and the, the idea of containment, we, we have to contain communism. Uh, on one hand, coupled with the possibility of nuclear war on the other, really shapes the way that the United States and the United Nations intervenes in Korea, which is in a very limited way. Now, Truman is thinking limited war. Douglas MacArthur, who's in charge, is thinking something else. And one of the problems is, is the definition of limited war. For, for, a, for the United States Army, the definition of limited war is anything less than all-out nuclear war. Uh, for, for, the, for presidential administrations, they're thinking, uh, in, uh, in, particularly in the case of, of Kennedy and Johnson, they're thinking counterinsurgency is, is limited war. And academics are thinking, wherever you've got something less than unconditional surrender, where you've got a negotiated surrender. That's limited war. And so you, you've got a, a fundamental problem about what it is we're going after. But Korea proves a couple of things. Limited war is possible, but conventional wars are really, really expensive. And so when Eisenhower comes into office in 1953, he, his major priority is not the military, ironically, as a, a former uh, General, uh, Supreme Allied Commander, his, his priority as president is the economy. And he's terrified that spending these billions of dollars on the U.S. military is not something that, that has a return on investment. So he wants to slash the, the military budgets and, and, con and focus on the American domestic economy. And the way that you do that is through air power. Air power and nuclear weapons can save you a whole lot of money. It's a, it's a strategy called massive retaliation. If the Soviets do something that we don't like, like invading Europe, we will m retaliate massively with nuclear weapons. And so uh, what kind of an army do you need in an era of massive retaliation that depends on aircraft and nuclear weapons? Well, well not much of one. And so there are a couple of things that really, really terrified folks about that whole idea. Uh, you can slash the budget pretty effectively with, the, uh, with this idea or this strategy of massive retaliation. Um, lets you reduce the number of, of but, uh, number of billions of dollars that you're spending on the military. But I, but I invite you to take a look at the, uh, the uh, little mem I have there at, at the bottom. If the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem begins to look like a nail. At, at what point do you, uh, at what, what is the magic line that the Soviets have to cross in order to, for the United States to massively retaliate? It's not well defined, right? I mean, that is, that is the fundamental problem with massive retaliation is that it, how do you, how do you retaliate for something like Meddling in, in the American election, for example. How, is that, are you going to nuke the, 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 uh, the Soviet Union over that? Or, there's, no inner, there's no proportionality to this approach. There is no, um, there's nothing less than total and, and, and um, unlimited nuclear war in, in this, with this approach. You know who really hated the idea of massive retaliation 
was, was a guy named Maxwell Taylor, who was the chief, Army Chief of Staff throughout the, uh, through most of the Eisenhower administration. He hated this for a couple of reasons, um, not, probably not the least of which is that it, it takes the Army out of the equation uh, quite a bit and massively cuts the budget. But even more than that, as he spells out in, in this, the book, The Uncertain Trumpet, he, he writes this book as he retires in 1959. He says, you know, the problem with massive retaliation is exactly what, what I just pointed out. It leaves you no room for negotiation. It leaves you no room for proportional response. He said, not only that, at what point do the Soviets stop believing that you're going to attack them back? At what point do they say, I don't think that they're going to attack us over this incursion into West Germany? At what point do, can you count on uh, what the Americans are going to do and, and, and where they're going to stop? It's unclear. It, it, it almost invites the Soviets to, to challenge us in some ways. And so he thought that we should really have some kind of a deterrence. You should give the Soviets and any, any other budding communist nation a reason to stop and think. So deterrence starts to be raised as, as, as something to be taken seriously. For a thousand bonus points that mean absolutely nothing, what movie is this? <laughs> exactly. Terrific movie, How I Learned to Love the Bomb. Anyway, so deterrence. Massive retaliation isn't a deterrence uh, at, at some point. You've got to give the Soviets something else to think about, and that's why he argues that the army, a, a powerful army, one capable of responding to Soviet aggression, is also necessary. And so Taylor comes up with the pentomic division. It's uh, probably not a coincidence that, that he kicks this off in 1956. It's a five-year plan uh, for testing and evaluation, which will coincide with the end of Eisenhower's second term. He wasn't a huge fan of this, but uh, there were a number of problems with the pentomic division. Essentially, what this, what this aims to do is eliminate the large, massive armies that, that we've come to know and love. The pentomic division essentially has five, in, instead of battalions and, and, and brigades or regiments, they have battle groups. Each division has five battle groups plus a mechanized infantry uh, battalion plus uh, an armor battalion. So it, the idea is that it's very small, it's dispersed, it can come together for a massive attack if it needs to, but then it can disperse again. Uh, it was tried in field exercises in Germany with the 3rd Infantry Division and the 1st Armored Division, lots of problems. Later they, uh, they, they actually begin to convert the 101st who runs into another into a number of problems. Other nations actually give this idea a try, and, and they quickly go back to the triangular division or, or the, the three brigades. Um, now, the one cool thing about the pentomic division is it's got nuclear weapons assigned to it in the, in the field artillery. So not only is this a, a different way of fighting, but it's also, it also puts the, the army in the nuclear club. The, uh, the M28, uh, the Davy Crockett is, is, a, is a, these are all tactical nuclear weapons. Um, but one of, the, one of the chief complaints of the, the Davy Crockett, you see it has a 1,000 to 6,500 meter range. Uh, one of the complaints of most of the troops was, hey, we don't really know if we're outside of that blast radius or not. But so, so lots of folks were uh, kind of concerned about that. So at the end of the Eisenhower administration, there are a number of folks who are, are pretty concerned about the, the, uh, the strategy of massive retaliation. And one of those guys is Maxwell Taylor, who comes out of retirement to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs under Kennedy. And so he obviously has a number of conversations with Kennedy about the problems inherent with massive retaliation. And so he, he bends Kennedy's ear, uh, and, they, and they start this, uh, this strategy of flexible response, which, which essentially uh, will become uh, mutually assured destruction uh, at some point. 
But at first, uh, you, you may remember from your history books that, that Kennedy runs on this idea of the missile gap. Uh, he, he said that the Eisenhower administration had allowed this huge gap in, in, in missiles between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has many, many more nuclear missiles than we do. Elect me, I'll fix this gap. Well, one of the problems with making uh, bold statements about what the Soviet Union is or isn't doing is it's a very closed society and it's anybody's guess what they're, what they're doing at any time. And so the public had no earthly idea uh, how many missiles each side had. Uh, Eisenhower uh, apparently had a, a pretty good idea, but he can't come out and say because it's all classified. So once Kennedy gets into, into office, he figures out that we are way ahead of the Soviets when it comes to missiles. But at some point, right, this, the whole idea of massive retaliation kind of loses its appeal when both sides, even if one side, like the United States, has overwhelming superiority in the number of missiles, at some point the Soviets have enough to also um, cause massive destruction to the United States. This, this idea, this strategy of massive retaliation it is kind of overcome by events, right? And so then you get into this idea of nuclear deterrence strategy. And this is counterintuitive to the way many people, many military theorists would think. You, you only win by not fighting, right? Fighting equals losing, because everybody is going to lose it, when you've got these massive numbers of, of nuclear weapons on each side. So um, both sides, the, the Americans and the Soviets, need to believe that they have a choice in whether or not to fight, or to, to launch a first strike. And each side needs to understand or believe that the other side will have a second strike capability. You know, as I, try, as I explain to my students, it's like, it's like you and I are standing here with guns pointed at each, at each other's head. And if I pull the trigger, you're going to know about it for 30 minutes before you have to pull your trigger, right? I mean, it's not going to be a secret what happens. And so, the, so stability is based on the idea that war, nuclear warfare will become so awful that nobody would ever begin. It must be mutual, it must be assured, and that both sides are going to be destroyed. If it's that awful, if you're dealing with reasonable people, then there should never be a nuclear war. Now, what maintains this deterrence is ironically the more nuclear weapons that you have, the more ways that you have to destroy each other, the more stabilizing it is. It's, it's kind of, you know, military double think here, but the more opportunity I have for destroying you, the fewer reasons that I would have to want to because both, of, both sides are going to be destroyed. And so this leads to the idea of the, the nuclear triad. You got submarine launched ballistic missiles. You've got uh, B-52s or aircraft launched ballistic missiles. You've got the, the nuclear missile silos throughout the Great Plains. All of these, uh, none of these can be destroyed. In a, not all of these can be destroyed in a, in a first strike. What is destabilizing, ironically, are things that would keep one side safe. The more vulnerable each side is, the safer the world is. Because if you do things like this in the lower middle picture here, anybody know what that is? That's exactly right. The, the safeguard anti-ballistic missile system, uh, which is designed to shoot down incoming nuclear missiles. This is considered destabilizing. It might make you safer. But the Soviets would see that as a reason that you might have to launch a first strike. If you think that you can survive what the Soviets are going to do, you might want to launch a first strike. Um, fallout shelters, also considered destabilizing, because a significant portion of your population would be safe, theoretically, in a nuclear exchange. So it must be mutual, and it must be assured that each side will be destroyed and that's how you keep the world safe. Like that. And so, in con to, to kind of wrap it up here, 
so the 301 block, as you see here, nuclear war and containment, all of these ideas, all of these strategies are, are, the, are the underlying, that this is the framework in which uh, we begin to talk about the Cold War era. The, the, uh, the Korea, Vietnam one, Vietnam two, um, building the army after, uh, it, uh, after Vietnam and, and preparing for a war in, in Europe, uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, all of, all of these classes, all of, all of these, this curriculum, is, the framework is the idea of containment and nuclear weapons that must be considered uh, as you go forward and talk about, uh, as you talk about these, these different topics. That, that's about it for the uh, formal portion of this presentation. If anybody has questions, we have the microphone in the back, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, uh, I read in Time magazine that uh, the People's Republic of China, I think that's how you say it, or believe that the United States kind of misled the Soviet Union or former Soviet Union in like the amount of nuclear weapons they had to um, to uh, motivate the uh, Soviet Union to make more weapons and then that destabilized their economy. Are you aware of any kind of trickery or ingenuity of that sort? Uh, not, not in, in when we, uh, when the United States builds the uh, anti-ballistic missile complex in, in the mid-1970s. This was, uh, the, the Soviet Union has thousands and thousands of nuclear missiles, would have easily overwhelmed that site. Uh, the site is actually designed as a counter against Chinese missiles, for what that's worth. They had six of them at the time, uh, uh, the, the, as, a, as a best guess. Now, quite, uh, quite famously, the Chinese and the, and the uh, and the, uh, the, the Soviet Union at this time um, were on the verge of warfare <laughs> throughout much of their uh, communist history. In fact, why Nixon goes to China in 1972 is to exploit this wedge between the two of them. So is there trickery? But, oh, probably. Am, am I positive how, how, what the numbers are on each side? No, not, I, I'm, I'm really not. But. Uh, yeah, quite, fam yeah, quite, uh, quite honestly, there, there was a huge divide in the way that the Chinese and the Soviets uh, thought that communism should be run. Uh, Dr. Mills, uh, NSC 68, I think, is a pivotal document yeah. led by Mr. Nitza. Uh, I think it was uh, not got, what, 1947-48 time frame like that, something like that, but stayed in Mr. Truman's inbox for quite some time that he was reluctant to sign it. Uh, yeah. My question is that, um, was Mr. Truman reluctant to sign it because he hoped for an improved relationship with the uh, Soviets? Uh, or was he just trying to forestall something until the economy could be righted a little bit better? Why, 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 did, why do we know about his reluctance to sign off on that? Until, uh, well, the, until the North Korean invasion. Uh, he, he was, uh, Terrified that uh, of the bill, quite honestly, to go from 13 billion to 50 billion that this thing required. Um, that, that's a significant commitment. In fact, it, it's most, it's mostly Korea um, that that really kicks this thing off. And, and folks are saying, "Oh, look, NSC 68 said that uh, we should have been doing this a while ago." And 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 I mean, it's in, only introduced in April, May, June. Uh, the, the attack comes. So he, doesn't, he, he is initially reluctant, but he also, it, it hasn't been around for very long and he's trying to put off the decision. Um, but, uh, but the invasion, as you well know, comes as, as a complete surprise to everyone. Um, so it, does, does that answer your question? He, yeah, the, NSC 68 comes so close on the heels of Korea that, uh, that a whole lot of people say it was Korea that really jump-started the, the whole idea and gave him the, the excuse and, and, or the um, legitimacy to, to, to really begin those kind of spending numbers. 
did Eisenhower kind of take the approach that he was going to keep the Soviets guessing? Uh, he wanted them to be unsure as to whether or not the United States would attack or retaliate with uh, nuclear weapons. And he thought that that would maybe keep them sort of uh, reluctant to start anything. Yeah, well, well, throughout the 1950s, I mean, we, well, one of the things that we often overlook is the fact that the Soviet Union has a whole lot of their own problems, and the last thing that they really needed at this point was an invasion of Western Europe. Um, so there were a number of issues keeping them from attacking. But to your, to your point, uh, what was Eisenhower thinking at this time? He, he, he was... Um, he was as hawkish as he could be with, with, the, um, with the means that he had available. Um, and he, he, he was uh, extremely anti-communist. He, he, he did a whole lot of things that, um, for example, the overflights of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviets are, are protesting loud and clear about the, the U.S. violating Soviet airspace? Nope, we're, that, that's something that we're going we're gonna to keep doing. Um, he, he also would not seriously entertain negotiations with the Soviets to, to ease tensions. He said, you people, he, essentially what he, his argument was is the, the Soviets are, are irresponsible or uh, un, uh, unreasonable people. And so you can't have a, a, a conversation, a meaningful conversation with unreasonable people. They, they simply will not change fundamentally what it is that they are as a government and what it is that they plan to do, which is spread communism throughout the world. So there is no point in seriously entertaining conversations until the Soviet Union becomes something fundamentally different from what it is. And so he, he was uh, quite hawkish. Uh, on, on the Soviet Union, um, where he could be, but uh, which was lack of not giving them legitimacy, not not ne seriously negotiating with them, and and politically, economically, uh, trying to trying to uh, put obstacles in their way. Yes, sir. Dr. Mills, thanks for thanks for your lecture today. Um, I'm going to ask you to comment a little bit outside your your topic here because you you've got your lecture in the context of the bipolar world. Currently, we're in a more multipolar world. And in the nuclear equations that we're talking about here, the biggest variable right now seems to be the behavior of North Korea. And South Korea, obviously, living within artillery range of North Korea, is quite concerned about all of North Korea's capabilities, conventional, chemical, nuclear, perhaps biological weapons as well. But South Korea has gone back and forth on how much they want to defend. For example, the THAAD system has been a big bone of contention. Yeah. And the Chinese have jumped in and said, South Korea, we don't want you to have that THAAD system. But once again, the Chinese have just completed one of the biggest civil defense programs in the history of mankind. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on going back to your slide where you had the things that are stabilizing and the things that are destabilizing and talk about what you think in the current Korean Peninsula context um, is stabilizing and destabilizing. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Unfortunately, there's no good answer. The, <laughs> A, there's no good answer, and B, I, I'm no expert on, on what's going on in Korea. Uh, but I just so happen to be accompanied by two of the brightest minds in the Department of Military History. Um, Gates Brown, for example, is, is a, quite a brilliant up-and-coming historian uh, who I'm sure has some thoughts on that. Gates? <laughs> Okay. See what I just did there? Yeah, that was good. All right. Um, so it, we've got destabilizing, destabilizing and stabilizing. That that, as you mentioned, is, in the context of deterrence, destabilizing. However, in a multipolar world, it still operates somewhat similarly in that U.S. efforts to provide 
consistency and clarity can be stabilizing. So if we look at mass retaliation or flexible response, both of those policies try to get to specific guidance you can communicate to an adversary. You can't always gauge the specific reaction, but you can at least make clear that there will be a price for provocative action. And I think when you try to look at what's going on in Korea, there's a material side where you're looking at deterrence, but that's not the only thing you have that's an anti-missile asset in the region. You also have things that are in Japan that are more on longer range missiles, and then there are naval assets too that are for shorter range. So in terms of what we added in Korea, it, that's not the only thing there. So I wouldn't necessarily classify that as inherently destabilizing. It's frustrating to China, but it also is not the first anti-missile asset that we have. I think one thing that a question as you brought up in the multipolar world, do you have a similar ability to have a clarified policy that can deal holistically with balancing these threats? It's relatively simple to do in the Cold War because especially in the 50s and 60s, there's, there's an assumption that you have a, a Moscow-driven side of the world and a Washington, D.C.-driven side of the world, and that generally the other interests can kind of fall under either one of those camps. Today, you have a lot more dichotomies. So you've got an India-Pakistan uh, nuclear standoff. You have uh, Korea, China, and Russia, to include the United States. How do you go about creating a holistic policy with a lot of these different regional imbalances. And that's one of the big struggles with, with deterrence today is instead of having a global approach to it, you'd have to have individual regional deterrences and, and balances of power. And it's very difficult to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the things I think as we look at the 21st century and what does deterrence look like today, it's much more difficult to have something like a, a blanket policy that says this is how we deter action. And that's why I think you'll have a lot more nuanced and specific approaches, things like adding a THAAD or providing more ground forces or having uh, specific carrots and sticks for different regions instead of we're just going to deal with this issue of nuclear deterrence holistically or global level. Is that? Thanks. <laughs> I read in a recent article that during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis that Fidel Castro had actually lobbied Moscow to use uh, tactical nuclear weapons or at least release their use, which based on your discussion would have impacted on this uh, flexible response uh, strategy. Uh, could you comment on what the mix of weapons in Cuba was at that time? and perhaps how use of any of the, the tactical level weapons would have impacted on Russian or U.S. strategy, or at least their philosophy in relationship to how the other would respond to one's action? Yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, in that the, the United States didn't know that there were tactical nukes at the time. I mean, all they, they, could, all they could tell from the satellite or reconnaissance photographs was that there were uh, medium or intermediate range missiles in, in Cuba, enough to be a major problem. And so one of the things, or one of the interesting aspects about that episode was that we really didn't understand what was there, and yet there were a whole lot of folks advocating for the invasion or the, or the bombing of, of those sites, or uh, in some cases, uh, advocating for the invasion of, of Cuba and to overthrow the, the Castro regime and uh, make sure that this never happened again, that we wouldn't be threatened so close to our, our own shores. And so um, if there had been invasion, we now know, I uh, read probably this same article that you did that, that said that there, was, there were tactical nukes and we could only assume that they were there for the very reason to oppose uh, a landing by the United States. And so if there had been tactical nukes used, uh, where would that have led? And, and the underlying problem with 
the Korean, or the Korean, uh, thanks Gates. The, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the fact that both, uh, was th that Cuba was a proxy for the Soviet Union, much as Berlin was, was, was a, a, uh, an, a democratic outpost in the middle of a communist uh, country, East Germany, for example. And so Cuba was very much that communist outpost in a, in the, in a democratic world or right off the, the coast of the United States. And so the year prior, the Berlin, uh, the, in the Berlin crisis, where the Soviets, or the East Germans actually, are, are threatening to invade militarily and take back uh, the democratic portion of Berlin that's held by the US and France and, Eng and, and the Brits. Um, the United States goes on record saying, we will defend Germany or, or, or Berlin with nuclear weapons. And then, uh, so if there had been tactical nukes used in, in, in Cuba, I could only imagine that that would have launched only a more determined effort to invade Cuba on, on the part of, of the United States, which would in turn have led the Soviets to respond in proportion, which would have meant taking back Berlin and when you take Berlin and we take, they take Berlin and we take Cuba, that's just a recipe for massive retaliation on both sides. Now, who's to say what would have actually happened? Um, hard to say, but the formula is certainly there for, for the end, uh, end of days, for lack, for if we want to be dramatic about it, but um, hey, when you're talking nuclear weapons, I think that's appropriate. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Uh, to this gentleman's uh, question over here, source on this is uh, Mr. Robert McNamara himself. We didn't know until about 25, 30 years after the fact that uh, release authority, that is to shoot the nuke, uh, had been released to the local commander by the Russians. Uh, our release authority is President of the United States. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess in, in terms of the destabilization uh, slide up there, is, you know, you don't know what you don't know in these circumstances. Uh, we already had amphibious forces en route to Cuba when things finally settled down, not knowing that the local Russian commander there had authority to shoot nukes. So, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you don't know what you don't know, and thank goodness for common sense prevailing. Which hardly ever happens, so. Anyone else? Um, I once heard, uh, perhaps erroneously, that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the Russians or the Soviets uh, were a little put out because they didn't have much of a blue water navy, evidently. And one of the Russian diplomats or military commanders uh, said, uh, this will never happen again. Did that spark a, a building of a, a, what you might call a blue water navy on the part of the Soviets? You know, I don't know a lot about the Soviet blue water navy, but I happen to be accompanied by a naval expert in the back of the room. Dr. John Kuhn. Actually, the past is actually <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, the uh, Soviet response after the Cuban Missile Crisis, because of the "quote unquote" quarantine, they they didn't have a conventional blue water capability to effectively challenge the quarantine. <clears throat> and and again, it, a blockade is an act of war, so we call it a quarantine, so so it wouldn't be an act of war. Um, and so technically the Soviets couldn't say that we had declared war by instituting a blockade of Cuba. But that caused immense problems inside Stavka, which is the high command of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and Stalin and Khrushchev had adopted Stalin's policies for a, what we call a sea control fleet that controlled the littorals of the Soviet Union. He basically, they, they looked at World War II and they go, what hurt the US Navy the most? And it was submarines and kamikaze aircraft. So they, they built submarines and cruise missiles, but they built them for close in defense of the littorals of the Soviet Union and in the Baltic. So uh, now those are massive, okay? 
but uh, these submarines were mostly diesel submarines, and again, the cruise missiles were very crude weapons, although some of them are still out there, by the way, um, and uh, places like Syria. Um, and so, so uh, Sergei Gorshkov uh, made the argument afterwards and convinced everybody that the Soviet, need, the Soviet Union needed to build a credible blue water capability to be able to challenge the Americans uh, uh, to do this. And so finally, the uh, Khrushchev and then his successor, Brezhnev, uh, underwrote uh, Gorshkov's expansion of the fleet. So when I joined the Navy in 1981, the joke was I'm, I'm joining the second largest Navy in the world, the Soviet Union, in terms of vessels uh, outnumbered the United States two to one in terms of the vessels. Now, most of those vessels did not have the long range that the U.S. naval forces had, all right? Uh, and they had absolutely no aircraft carriers. Uh, the, the, the ships that they had that were aviation ships were really aviation cruisers with, with helicopters, and it was only at the last minute they really got short-range uh, fixed-wing aircraft on some of them. And those were only meant to shoot down uh, P-3s uh, looking for their boomers in the uh, so-called bastions. So, so, the, uh, so the, the, they did build the Navy up. It, was never, it never got to, to the point where it was as capable as it could be. The Soviets, when they would, when they would deploy, they would... They would take their ships to foreign ports, and the ships would promptly break down in those ports. The Russian Navy still does the same thing today. And, and then it would take months to get the parts and fix them, and then they'd pray to God that they could get home and, and, and get back to port. But they would always go to what we call an anchorage, uh, shallow water somewhere, whether it was in the Eastern Med, whether it was off Socotra Island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, these uh, anchorages spread out all, all over the entire globe. And, uh, and, and, and it made it easy to go find them and do reconnaissance on them, which was what I did when I was in the Navy. I was a recon guy. And, uh, and they'd, just, they'd anchor, they'd turn off the engines, they'd go on water hours, and they'd suffer. They'd suffer. Uh, when, uh, when the 1980s came along and the Reagan buildup and the equivalent response to the Soviet, Soviet uh, rail-borne and intermediate-range uh, missiles, new-generation missiles that, uh, that the lunatic and drop-off started to deploy, uh, we deployed the Pershings and the Glickums and the Alcums, and the Soviets did their equivalent response to ours, and they tried to forward deploy that Navy, old Yankee-class ballistic missile submarines on the East Coast, and cruise missile submarines with nuclear weapons that could incinerate San Jose in like 30 minutes, and they broke their Navy. So they never really quite got there. They tried to get there, and Gorshkov was the father of that expansion of the fleet, but it's not too far-fetched a, uh, a stretch to say that in that response, the Soviet Union had just another thing to break the Soviet Union. Dr. Mills, on the slide you have up there, you have the RECON, for short for Reconnaissance Satellites. And yeah. um, part of my question has to do with the doctrinal definition difference between reconnaissance and surveillance. And I would argue that our surveillance satellites, such as the Defense Support Program, that are staring at the whole globe and can detect an ICBM or an SLBM launch very shortly after it clears five miles altitude, which for a ballistic missile is, happens very quickly, um, that the surveillance satellites in, were in, in far more important to stability than the recon satellites, which actually helped count the number of silos or the number of uh, submarine berths. So I'm wondering if uh, you would agree or disagree with me that maybe that should say surveillance satellites rather than reconnaissance satellites. Dr. Kuhn is jumping up and down in the, in, in the back. Well, I would say we have Dr. Caleb here. Yeah, the, no, these systems can't really talk about them. Um, I, Kalik might be able to because he's he's knows what the unclassified sources are. Um, but there is a difference when you use the word surveillance and you use the word reconnaissance. Yeah. Um, uh, when it comes to strategic intelligence, strat intel and op intel, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I think your premise is correct that surveillance uh, is more aimed at sort of uh, DSP and stuff like that. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> would be to just remove any descriptor and just put satellites. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I kind of feel bad that we haven't asked Dr. Laver any questions. Anybody have a Civil War question? 
<laughs> so, uh, with that. That last photo on the lower right, though, uh, is that uh, some reference to Star Wars? Yeah. Is that what yeah, Star Wars. You don't want to talk about the uh, SDI. very high tech uh, shoot down. Yeah. All right, with that, hey, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, remember, remember that none of us are as smart as all of us, right? A group effort. Thanks to my colleagues for, uh, for the assist. The blizzard of 49. Where was the blizzard? Well, it, it was, mostly it hits the northern Great Plains. Um, and 